Once upon a time, there was a poor nation located far away in the north of Europe. The people living there worked hard on their land, trying to feed their large families. Children born in this nation rarely lived longer than age 50. In fact, one in ten children died before their fifth birthday from illnesses like tuberculosis or from accidents like drowning. The name of this nation was Finland. The people of this nation came together and decided that the only way out of this dire situation was to invest in the well-being and education of its citizens. They established a universal system of health and social care, including comprehensive prenatal services, and reformed their school system to enable all children to receive the same high-quality education. They called the new system a welfare state and made a promise that all citizens would have the same rights regardless of their family status or where they lived. In order to know if they were keeping their promise, they established a system of record-keeping for these services. Over the years, the new system gained strength and produced great results. Thirty years into the building of the welfare state, a child born into a Finnish household had a life expectancy of over 70 years. In the recent years, Finland was found in many international comparisons to be the best country to be born into, where children are receiving the best education in the world, and people are among the happiest. But let me take you back to the system of record-keeping. As the welfare state expanded, the system of record-keeping expanded as well. The records came to include all facets of the welfare state, including benefits, health and social services, educational system, and so on. The record-keeping system was built in such a way that for research purposes, the different records could be linked for every individual, and family members could be linked to each other. This made it possible to create data sets that follow the lives of all Finnish children born in a certain year. Two such data sets were created and are known today as the 1987 and 1997 Finnish birth cohorts. They document the lives of all Finnish children born in these years, as well as the lives of their parents, altogether more than 360,000 individuals. 180,000 per cohort. Using these data, researchers such as myself are able to draw a detailed picture of the conditions in which Finnish children are growing up and how that childhood conditions are impacting their later well-being. For seven years, I was leading the research team that worked with these data, and I'd like to tell you what we learned from our studies and what we did with that information. We saw in numerous studies that while majority of Finns had benefited from the welfare state, a minority of families were still struggling. For these families, difficulties were accumulating and parents' problems were being passed on to their children. But what the data also showed was that in other cases, the same kinds of situations, like parental death, illness, separation, or poverty, did not cause problems for the children. So, we became curious. What was it in those families that protected children from later problems? What made those families and children resilient in the face of difficulties? And what was the role of the welfare state and its different services in creating resilience, which is commonly defined as the ability to bounce back from difficulties? In our analysis of resilient families and children, we saw that when the parents were going through difficult times, 
There were other people in the family's life helping to carry the burden. We also saw that as a result of people stepping up for the family, these children's lives continued running smoothly, and they were able to keep up with their hobbies and other activities, just like other kids, despite the parents' difficulties. We saw that sometimes these actions that helped build resilience happened spontaneously as a result of actions from the family's own network, and other times the public sector, such as teachers or medical staff treating a sick parent or a social worker, were stepping in and making sure there were people around supporting the family. As a result of our findings, colleagues of mine developed a new service model whereby every time an adult is faced with major difficulties, whether it's a health or social issue, they are asked if there are children in the family and what needs to be done in order to make sure that the family gets the support they need. The model is called Let's Talk About Children. It's a community-based approach that ropes in all the important people from the family's own life in the promotion of the children's well-being. The model also directs the professionals and the family members to look at the child's own strengths and interests and how these could be helpful in dealing with the challenging situation. How does the model look like in practice? Let's take, for example, Maria a single mother with an eight-year-old daughter, Ella, and a six-year-old son, Eino. Their father is not present in their lives. One day, Maria notices a lump in her breast and goes to see a doctor. Diagnosis, breast cancer. Luckily, the medical team, having been trained in the Let's Talk About Children model, asks if Maria has children, and she tells them about Ella and Eino, and they talk about how she can open up the discussion with her children about the illness and what this will mean for them. The medical team tells Maria that what helps children most is if they can continue their lives normally, for instance, continue their hobbies and to see their friends. In fact, this is one of the insights the model is built on that it is simple things like this that help children cope in a difficult situation. The medical team also encourages Maria to tell the kids' teachers about her situation so that they can be aware of what's going on in the children's lives and understand possible changes in behavior. Having knowledge of the home environment allows the teachers to make sure that the school environment is a stabilizing factor in the children's lives rather than another source of problems. As Maria is a single parent, it becomes clear that she's also going to need practical help while undergoing treatment. A meeting is set to plan for these practical steps, this time involving a worker from the municipal family services, as well as Maria's brother, who lives close to the family. In this meeting, Maria's brother promises to take care of the children while Maria is having treatment, check their homework and bring them to their hobbies. The municipal family service worker promises to provide additional home services, such as cleaning or childcare for the days that Maria's brother is not available. A meeting is also set in three weeks' time to see if Maria is getting the promised support and if it's enough to help the family cope. Now, let's imagine for a moment how things might have gone without the model. Without prompting from the medical team, Maria might have kept her worries to herself. The brother might have been left out. The children might have had to drop out of their hobbies, and the reactions from the teachers might have been less understanding. It's not difficult to see all the different ways things could have gone wrong. So, to recap, what are the crucial elements of the model? Number one, 
service providers dealing with adults in challenging situations ask if the client has children. Number two, important people from the family's own network step in to help. And number three, family or other services providing extra help where needed. The common goal being that children's lives continue as normally as possible, despite the parents' difficulties. In other words, simple, everyday actions delivered when the family needs them, preventing the escalation and accumulation of problems. The model, let's talk about children, is an integrated, family-centered service model that is free for anyone to use, and there are English-language resources available online. The model is already being implemented in different parts of Finland, and the results are highly encouraging. We just did an evaluation in a structurally challenged municipality and found that with the help of the model, the usual fragmentation of health, social and educational services could be overcome, thereby reducing the need for child protective services. The model addresses those wicked problems, the accumulation of family problems and parental problems being passed on to the next generation, that the welfare state had not been fully able to solve, as was shown by the cohort studies I talked about earlier. So as you can see, we are still working to fulfill the promise of the welfare state, to create conditions for all children to flourish, irrespective of their family situation. Because, as we all know, when children flourish, families and communities flourish as well. Thank you.